you know, I've always been interested in health. Uh, I think uh, I've been interested in, in taking care of things for a long time. I, I remember way back when, when I uh, was studying to be a Spanish high school teacher, and I was, I was really young, I had an old Mustang and, and the, the brakes went out and I took it to the auto shop and I realized that they had done a lot of things to the, on the brake job that really didn't need to be done according to several mechanic friends I had. So I basically taught myself auto mechanics. So if you wanna do something right, really do it yourself. Okay. You always know that you will do everything you can to make it right and not do things that are not necessary. So that's why I taught myself auto mechanics, uh, that's why I taught myself how to do carpentry, how to do plumbing, uh, so that I could do those things around the house and know that a good and thorough job with the, with the best materials had been done. So certainly uh, the most important thing to take care of is your body. So, and these are the things that I have found that have helped take care of my body so that uh, now, uh, when I turn uh, 70 years old next month, uh, I've got a few, mi few more miles left. So uh, it's worked well for me, and it's based on a lot, a lot of books and articles that I've read and researched. Uh, since I, in that six years I was retired, I, I probably read, I don't know, five, 6,000 articles researching health. Uh, I've, I've got several thousand that I cataloged that I thought were important. I, I probably read, and I probably only cataloged one out of every seven or eight that I, that I looked at. So um, this is evidence-based stuff that I'm going to give you. And if you have evidence that some of the stuff I'm going to tell you isn't right, please share it with me because I'm always open to change. I, I think that's the secret to, uh, to life is to continually try to improve and to learn new things and to be open to changing what you do. Because uh, as we're going to see, I think that the key, ooh, see how it works, a key to, key to health is having good habits. Well, that's the first thing on there. I think another key to health is eating the right foods, eating healthy foods. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, another equally important thing is good sleep, and we'll talk about that. Uh, absolutely, you can't really be totally healthy unless you exercise, and we'll talk about that. And finally, you have to take care of your mental health, and we'll talk about how you can do that. So that's what we're going to try to do today in two hours. I'm, I'm quoting this famous guy, Paul Mabry here, the secret to wellness is to slowly change your bad habits into good ones while starting many new positive ones along the way. Now, habits are a very, very powerful thing. Do you all realize that probably 80% of everything you do is done by habit, okay? You have a habit of how you put your socks on. You have a habit of how uh, you back out into the street. You stop just before the street, you look left, you look right, you look, I look left again and look right again. I double check and then I back out into the street. You have uh, a habit of how, how you get to work. You don't think about the turns you're going to make and uh, how fast you're going to go. You just, you know, you get in the car and you're listening to music or maybe an audio book. Uh, could even be using the hands free to talk on your cell phone. And you, yep, you wind up at work. And that's a habit. And sometimes, like with me, uh, if I'm doing something unusual, like they, they want to go to a restaurant in, in Oklahoma, but we start talking and get busy, and all of a sudden I find myself heading the other direction for work, you know, because I, the, it's that time of day when I normally go to work, but instead it's Saturday and we're going to Oklahoma, and I just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not thinking about it, and you fall into those habits. So, 80% of what you do is done by habit. Okay? You don't think about it. Uh, I've read a lot, a lot of books. Uh, on my Audible account now, I've got 780 books, I believe. 
And a lot of those books are, what would I say, self-help books, but uh, more they're, they're books that uh, people have spent years looking at the science on a, a certain subject. This one is not as much in depth uh, on, the, on the scientific history of habit formation, but he did review quite a few published articles for this one. And uh, it's, it was uh, on the, net, the New York Times bestseller list forever and ever. It may still be there for all I know, uh, The Power of Habits. Uh, but it, uh, it's a very simple concept that we're gonna go over here. And uh, I certainly found I, I found I was doing it before I knew read the book but I think I do it better now that I have read the book. And he gets into what's called the habit loop, okay? So with a habit, there's a trigger. It's time to go to work, you know? Uh, it's a certain time of the morning. Uh, uh, it might be that you, the habit is smoking a cigarette. So sm cigarette smokers have definite triggers and there can be multiple triggers. So uh, they're, they, uh, get up in the morning and that seems to trigger them to want to have a cigarette as soon as possible. Then they want to have another one after they eat breakfast. Uh, then they want to have another one in the car on the way to work. And then they want to have one at their first coffee break. So there are triggers. And then you get the routine. The routine is to sit there and relax, to get the cigarette out, pick one out, put it in your mouth and, and smoke it. And then, then the reward, of course, is the relaxed feeling that they get from the uh, from the nicotine, okay, or in some cases, the, they, they don't, uh, uh, their nicotine sensors are so, uh, their nicotine receptors in their brain are so low that without that uh, nicotine, they can't even feel normal. So they're not really getting a rush anymore, they're just feeling normal, and they can't do that without the cigarettes. So, because they've developed a tolerance, and we're going to talk about tolerance later. So these are my five steps to changing your habits. Now, you pick a habit that you don't want to have anymore. So that's the first step is to pick the habit that you want to change. And the, the important point here is trying to change too many habits at once or changing habits too drastically can lead to failure. So you guys are so young and you've got so many years ahead of you that you don't have to rush this. If you rush it, uh, it's not gonna go well. Uh, I was a Russian translator for many years and the, the Russians have a saying called and what it means is uh, when you hurry, people laugh at you. So uh, don't, don't try to rush it. And uh, don't, don't try to do too much at one time. Slow and steady wins the race. Step two, identify the triggers. And the important thing here is that there could be a lot of triggers like we discussed. And so you need to decide what you're gonna do when any one of those triggers that triggers you into a certain habit come up. Let's use smoking as an example here. Um, obviously they've got to do something. Okay. So the last thing I want them to do is to put sugar in their mouth. You all know me. <laughs> okay. So uh, I, I came up with uh, other things they can do. Some people actually take a, a rubber band, put it around their wrist, and then uh, pull the rubber band away from their wrist and let it snap back. And if you do it at just the right sensation, it can actually become a, a somewhat pleasant sensation. Uh, the uh, Chinese uh, have what's called stress balls. And so um, they're little round balls, maybe uh, an inch to an inch and a half in diameter. And they usually have a bell in them so that when you move them around, they ring. And you can get two of them and usually you put them in your hand and then you can switch them around just by opening and closing your hand, they'll change position and move around in your hand. And it's a very nice sensation. So uh, instead of pulling out the cigarette, reach in your pocket and, and pull, up, pull out the, uh, the Chinese worry balls, and then you can buy them on Amazon or at any uh, Chinese food store. Uh, some, uh, uh, 
I know uh, one person who was successful in, in stopping smoking and, and the habit that he substituted for the cigarettes was a yo-yo. So he kept a yo-yo in his pocket and, and when it was time to go smoke a cigarette, he pulled out the yo-yo and of course that would be kind of hard in the, the car. <laughs> so you might want to have another, uh, uh, it's okay to, and we're going to talk about this, it's okay to replace one habit with multiple habits. So you might want to have a couple of things that you do when you get that urge for the cigarette or when you get that, uh, uh, you know, that urge to do whatever the habit is that you want to break. So now then, uh, the, so that's what we said. You find a constructive habit that will give you a similar reward. It's okay to replace a single habit with two or more. So step three was to select the replacement. Step two was to identify the triggers, select the replacement. Step four, set the date. Okay, commitment. Okay. Uh, you got it to your own self, be true and honest. So if you do decide to take this path of trying to change your habits, okay, you have to say, I'm not gonna cheat on myself. I'm not going to give myself a bad deal. I really on board with changing this habit, okay? I'm not trying to change too many habits. I picked one habit that I really wanna get rid of and I'm gonna commit not to engage in that habit for a firm minimum time, it's like say two weeks or a month or, or whatever. So whatever you think you can really succeed at. So it might be just for an hour and you, uh, you may need multiple, multiple attempts to change that habit. It may be so strong. I, I going back to the smoking thing, uh, I think that the average number of times that people uh, try to quit before they're successful for a year is 11, as I remember in one study. That was the average minimum number of times that they tried to change a habit. So another thing I'm recommending in step four, set the date, is to make a list of the reasons you want to change the habit and carry it around with you. You can put it in your wallet or your purse, or just a, a three by five note card and write all the reasons why it would be such a good idea if you could get rid of that habit. And you, then if, if it's applicable, you could put on there all the reasons why it would be nice to add the habit that you're, that you're adding in place of it. So for instance, let's say it was your habit every morning to, I don't know, watch a certain a TV show that you really kind of enjoyed, but you know, uh, it took a lot of your time and you'd rather, you know, go to the gym on that day. Like every Saturday you watched a certain show, you could say, well, you know, instead of watching this show, I'm going to tape it and see if I have time to watch it later, but I'm going to go to the gym every Saturday morning at, at uh, 1030 instead of watching that, that television show or, or whatever it is. Because uh, with resistance training, once a week is, is plenty to make great progress in resistance training. And we'll, we'll talk about that later. So that's another example of how you could change a habit. Um, and finally, in this set the date uh, uh, thing, I, I think you should make signs and put them around the house uh, to remind you of your commitment. Uh, tell all your friends and get rid of enablers, which what, by that I mean, get rid of all your cigarettes. Uh, get rid of uh, all the, the cookies you're not going to eat anymore when you watch TV or you know, uh, get rid of whatever it is that you're not going to eat out of your cabinet. Uh, if one of, one of your acquaintances that you engage in that habit with regularly says, gives you a lot of hard time and says, well, I can't, I don't understand why you're, you're stopping this. I you think you're crazy. You know, I'm, I'm not going to stop and I'm not going to help you stop. Well, you might have to reconsider how much time you want to spend with that that person. Uh, there are a lot of enablers of a lot of habits out there. Okay. Then just do it. Okay. I've said about that. Now, uh, this is a kind of an amazing man. I, he's one of my heroes. Uh, his name's uh, Robert Lustig. He's a, uh, he's a pediatric neuroendocrinologist. 
in the Department of Pediatrics at University of California, San Francisco. He's a professor emeritus now, and he do, he's done a lot of, he has numerous published peer-reviewed papers. This, what I'm going to talk to you about with Dr. Lustig is not about diet. It's about uh, habit and addiction and rewards and how basically they've used the addictive properties of food to make money. Uh, and in, in, the, in the course of that, they've also, well, I, I didn't put the thing in here, but they've, they've also, these big corporations, the, the processed food manufacturers, the sugar uh, sellers, uh, have spent a large amount of money to muddy the science on how bad sugar is for us. Uh, documented in, uh, the, uh, in JAMA, how they, they paid the scientists at Harvard in 1970, uh, $50,000 each to not criticize uh, uh, sugar, but to criticize saturated fat in their paper. And that was published in JAMA. And there's, there's other things that they've done. So anyway, that's Dr. Dr. Lustig, and we'll get to him in just a minute. And this is so important for mental health. What he points out is there's two kinds of enjoyments in life, or things that make life good. And one of them is pleasure, and everybody needs some pleasure in their life. So pleasure is enjoyment or satisfaction derived from what is to one's liking, gratification, or reward. And we're going to get into how that differs from happiness and contentment. So happiness is the quality or state of being happy, uh, feeling joy, or, or having contentment. So uh, those are really two different things, and we're going to look at some of the differences uh, here. Uh, pleasure, among other things, is an emotional state where your brain says, and this is quoting Dr. Uh, Lustig, this feels good, I want more. And there's a high risk of pleasure leading to addiction. It's a short-lived phenomenon. Happiness, or contentment, is the emotional state where the brain says, this feels good, I don't want or need any more. Uh, you cannot get addicted to happiness. Okay? And we're going to talk about how that goes here. Well, I, I'm going to have to move this, see if I can move your faces off to the side because it's on my slide. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so, uh, so this is comparing pleasure versus happiness on seven criteria. So one, uh, pleasure is usually short-lived minutes or hours at most. Happiness and contentment can last for days, weeks, and even years. Pleasure is usually exciting, activating the sympathetic nervous system, like a, a casino gambling or a football game or an action movie or a strip club. Those are the examples Dr. Lustig used. And uh, whereas contentment and, and pleasure is usually calming, slows the heart rate, like watching your grandkids enjoy the merry-go-round or holding hands with someone you care about. Uh, and then uh, pleasure can be achieved with chemical substances like cocaine, caffeine, alcohol, and of course, sugar. Okay. Whereas contentment is achieved with deeds, not drugs, and includes things like graduations or marriages. Okay. Uh, pleasure usually comes when you take or receive something you want, like a, a jackpot at the casino or a box from Amazon, and it fades quickly. Happiness comes when you give something, like money to charity, time to your child, or effort to a worthwhile project. Uh, happiness, the reward is yours alone, and you sense, your sense of reward doesn't immediately impact anyone else or society at large. It's something that's isolating, okay? Uh, happiness, on the other hand, and contentment usually require and involve others. If the reward pathway is overstimulated, it can lead to addiction, dejection, destitution, disease, and death. Overstimulation of the contentment pathway can't lead to addiction, digestion, <laughs> destitution, disease, or death. Reward is driven by dopamine, and we're going to talk about a lot about that. Uh, 
and, and the significance of that. Uh, happiness is driven by serotonin. Let's talk about the getting contentment and, and because we're going to talk a whole lot about the pleasure and the problems with that. But this is how Dr. Lustig recommended uh, achieving contentment. Connect with other individuals, family, friends, clubs, teams, and faith communities. Okay, that's going to get you uh, uh, contentment. Uh, contribute. Create a happy, loving home. Make your place of work better and supporting your community. Coping. Okay, that's like being healthy. Get your sleep, your exercise. Meditate, enjoy nature, and express gratitude. Okay, and finally, eating. Okay, well, so the, he put the C as cook. Okay, when possible, cook real food for yourself. Avoid processed foods with ingredients that you don't uh, know are there. I, when you go to a restaurant, you really kind of never know what you're getting, and you, there's a lot of bad things that you could get at restaurants. Now we're going to talk about the, how this works in the brain with the neurotransmitters. Okay. The pleasure pathway is the mesolimbic pathway, and it's driven by dopamine. The happiness and contentment pathway is the mesocortical pathway, and it's driven by serotonin. Here's a, a diagram of the, the, the pathways, and you can see that the mesolimbic pathway starts in the ventral tegmental area, driven by dopamine, and you can see it off to the left. The mesolimbic pathway, the pleasure pathway, uh, it starts here, and then the uh, mesocortical pathway right here starts as the green one and goes like this. Now I'm gonna break them down, so we'll go on to the next slide here. So the mesolimbic pathway here, when the ventral uh, tegmental area neurons uh, fire, dopamine is released in the nucleus accumbens. So when you feel something pleasure, like you eat, you, you sniff cocaine, you eat some sugar, you, you win a jackpot at the, uh, at the casino, uh, you smoke a cigarette, whatever, that stimulates the ventral tegmental area here. And that ventral, te ventral tegmental area then fires its neurons that, that go up to the nucleus accumbens here, and uh, dopamine is released into the nucleus accumbens, and that dopamine causes the hypothalamus, which is right here, to release endogenous opioid peptides or endorphins, and it generates a feeling of pleasure or bliss that's very transient. Uh, the nucleus accumbens is also a learning center, so it uh, it remembers, it's right near the hippocampus, and it stimulates you to remember those things that, that made you feel good. And so that's how you're able to make new habits. So it takes a while. And one thing I didn't mention was uh, for a, a habit to be maintained for one year, for instance, with smoking, there's, there's a large study, that you basically have to be totally abstinent from cigarettes for 11 weeks uh, to have an, uh, um, a 50-50 chance of being smoke free after one year. So it takes a while. So now this is the mesocortical pathway. And what happens here is when you do those things that give contentment, like helping somebody or helping your children or doing something good, the dorsal raphe nucleus is actually stimulated and releases, re releases serotonin in all over the brain, but all over the prefrontal cortex. And we're going to talk about how that works in just a minute. So how can this lead to addiction? Okay. That's, that's the danger here. This is my personal opinion. This is not out of any peer-reviewed journal. Uh, but what I consider an addiction is a destructive habit, okay, that's not good for you, that you are unable to turn into a constructive habit using the steps I have described, okay? So that's my personal opinion on, on what an addiction is. Uh, we could sit here and argue all day on what's addiction and what's not addiction about, you know, tolerance, withdrawal, 
all that stuff. But uh, and we can do it in the questions if you want to do that. So now I want to you to hear in Dr. Lustig's own words uh, how seeking too much pleasure can kill your contentment and uh, lead to addiction. Hi, my name is Ashley Mason and I'm an assistant professor of psychiatry at UCSF and I'm here with Rob Lustig who is a neuroendocrinologist here at UCSF as well and today we're talking about his new book called The Hacking of the American Mind. So now why do we care? So what? Well it turns out dopamine excites the next neuron and neurons when they're excited too much too frequently tend to die. So the neuron has a defense mechanism against that. What it does is it reduces the number of receptors that are available to be stimulated in an attempt to try to mitigate the damage. When you say to be stimulated, you mean to be excited? To be excited, that's right. And so we have a name for that process. It's called downregulation. And a lot of different chemicals in the body do that. Now, you get a hit, you get a rush, the receptors go down. Next time, you need a bigger hit to get the same rush because there are fewer receptors to occupy. And you need a bigger hit and a bigger hit and a bigger hit until finally taking a huge hit to get nothing. That's called tolerance. And then when the neurons start to die, that's called addiction. Serotonin, however, is inhibitory. It's not excitatory. It inhibits its receptor to provide contentment to zen out, if you will. So you can't overdose the serotonin neuron. And what does it mean to in inhibit a receptor? What it means is it binds, but it doesn't activate the process beyond the receptor. So what it does is it basically slows down those neurons okay. instead of causing them to fire up. And so by doing, and in doing so, you end up with the process of contentment, that feeling of one with the world, if you will, that thing we call happiness. Now, there's one thing that downregulates serotonin, dopamine. So the more pleasure you seek, the more unhappy you get. And Las Vegas, Madison Avenue, Wall Street, Silicon Valley, and Washington, D.C. have very specifically and in a coordinated fashion confused and conflated term happiness with the term pleasure so that you can buy happiness so that they can sell you their junk it's called the American economy and it's based on hedonic substances substances that drive pleasure rather than happiness and in the process we have become most decidedly unhappy let's say you take up a bad habit like cocaine and it really sets the, the uh, ventral tegmental area off. So let me get back to the, um, to the diagram so I can show you. So it's going to cause the ventral tegmental area here to put out a whole bunch of signals releasing dopamine into the nucleus accumbens. And the first time you do it, uh, the, um, the nerves that are stimulated in the nucleus accumbens are gonna put out a ton of dopamine and you're gonna get a huge reward. Well, it turns out that this is an, an active stimulation of those nerves in the nucleus accumbens by the, by the nerves in the ventral uh, tegmental area. And so when a nerve is stimulated too much, it's hard on the nerves. It's like uh, you're, you have a car and you're over revving it. If you, if you take cocaine, it's like you pushed your, the, the gas pedal all the way to the floor and you're really over revving your engine. So that's, uh, a lot of cars have what's called a governor on them to prevent you from revving the engine too much. And our own body has that same kind of a safeguard built in, desensitization it's called. So in other words, those nerves that are stimulated in the nucleus accumbens, they become less sensitive and they do that by decreasing dopamine receptors on their surface. So uh, that the next time you take cocaine, you don't get nearly the rush that you got the first time you took it because a lot of those 
receptors have been removed by the nerves to try to protect themselves. And eventually they can only remove so many of those. And if you're continually stimulating it with more and more uh, cocaine, uh, the cells can actually start to die. So what uh, Dr. Lustig correctly points out is that that state where they have um, desensitized themselves is called tolerance. Okay, so you need have to, needs more cocaine to get the same thrill, and that state where they begin to die, that's the addiction level. And it's really a sad thing because, uh, yes, they can, they, the brain can grow new nerves, but if enough of them die, and if the, the diet is poor enough, you can't, uh, there's something called a beating that blood allows them to grow back, and you don't, can't, can't produce enough of that. And some people who have been alcoholic for years or cocaine users for years and years and years have so many cells dead that they can't stop because uh, they have to have it just to get be anywhere near normal. And they're even below normal in how, how much re their reward center is stimulated. They, even when they're using their substance, they're not happy. They're not getting a big buzz off the beer. They just have to have the, the alcohol to be normal. Uh, and the other thing that Dr. Lustig would have mentioned to you is that increased dopamine production in that area suppresses uh, serotonin production in the, uh, the uh, RAF nuclei. So it will depress the mesocortical pathway. That's why, in my opinion, when you're dealing with, with, a, with a true addiction, uh, there's only one way to, to treat it, and that's cold turkey. So, um, you know, I, I know this is uh, kind of harsh and, and absolute, and it's totally against all my principles, because my main principle that I try to use in life is, uh, the ancient Greek principle of moderation, and cold turkey is the total opposite of moderation. But I don't think that the old Greek principle of moderation works very well for addictions, okay? Uh, obviously, both pleasure and happiness are necessary, but there needs to be a balance, and that's moderation. And too much pleasure can make it difficult to have any happiness and contentment, and vice versa, too much Happiness and contentment can make it difficult, make uh, you an awful dull person. So um, this is how Aristotle said it. Virtue is the golden mean between two vices, the one of excess and the other of deficiency. So for everything in life, everything, billions of things, there is a mean that can be achieved and uh, you can only try to work on this. Uh, this is not uh, exclusive to ancient Greece. Uh, uh, the uh, 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 Ashikaga Gakko is a school about 70 miles north of Tokyo in Japan. And I found this, this picture here. And this thing in the picture is a uh, Yuzanoki. And it's at, uh, was found at the school. The school was founded in uh, 900. AD. Okay. And, and most of this teaching comes from China, actually. So uh, I, I, I haven't had a chance to research moderation in China, but I think it's probably a big part of, of their uh, cultural tradition also. Uh, but uh, this is an interesting teaching device in that, that there's water in that, that square basin, and that's a scooper for the water. And what, what it teaches the students is, if you fill this uh, hanging uh, pot up about halfway, it will, instead of leaning towards you, it will sit straight up. Okay. But then if you add more water to it, it will tip over to the left and pour out. So it's, it's teaching you how to find the golden mean to get the pot uh, to sit straight up. And I found, I, I was looking at uh, moderation in the Wikipedia, and I found out that there's an Islamic tradition also 
of a middle path of moderation. It's called Witsatia. Evidently, it's quite a, a big uh, movement um, in the uh, Quranic world. So uh, it's not just, you know, it's kind of a universal principle that evidently a, lo a lot of really smart people have found make for a pretty good life. And this, I put this slide in uh, just as an example of balance in your life. So uh, this one is uh, cowardice versus recklessness, okay? And the, the, the perfect mean is courage. So obviously, if you, you don't have any courage, you're, you're a coward. But if you have too much courage, you're reckless. And you need to find that mean. That was important for me in my military career. Now I want to talk to you, and I think we have enough time before we take our break. I just want to get through the dose response curve for the uh, uh, mesolimbic pathway, which you remember the, the ventral tegmental area here uh, releases uh, dopamine in the nucleus accumbens, and that gives you your reward. So uh, this is looking at the dose, dose response curve here that happens in the uh, nucleus accumbens. And as you, it's a really complicated slide and I totally apologize, but for any given dose of dopamine from, you know, uh, the, uh, from a low dose to a high dose of dopamine, you're gonna get a different response in terms of reward. So, and when you're getting the, the best reward, you, it's, it's fun, you're focused, you, you can pay attention, you have energy to do whatever you're doing that's giving you this reward. Okay. So, uh, but uh, to the, in the other way, it makes you lethargic on if, you do, if you're not getting enough, uh, if you're over here uh, and you're not uh, getting much uh, response at all from, from your dopamine. And uh, it can make you irritable and aggression and befuddlement if you have high dopamine, yet you're getting a low response because the dopamine can cause irritability, aggression, and befuddlement if you're not getting any reward for it. The points that I wanna make in the slide are that you are all using medications that can uh, tone down the rewards people are getting in the reward center, and, and they're called antipsychotic medicines or neuroleptics. Okay, so Risperdal, uh, Olanzapine, all those medicines, the, how do they work? They, um, they block the action, they block the dopamine receptors. So they're all either block the release of dopamine or block dopamine receptors. And they put you down here where you have a very low reward level because they're blocking the action of the dopamine. And then um, drugs over here and the drugs that would put you over here are things like cocaine or, um, or methamphetamine that cause massive dopamine releases. And so you wind up over here, and even though you have a massive dopamine release, you're getting a very low reward. And the other things interesting that you see stress here, as I circle stress, uh, actually high cortisol levels shift this curve to the right so that you're not getting uh, much reward. It, makes, it can make it hard to get reward from things that usually would give you pleasure. And just a few other interesting things that, that uh, Dr. Lustig pointed out was that there are, this VAL-158 and VAL are, are, are both dopamine receptor genotypes. So in other words, if you have the 158 genotype, you're gonna get a lot less reward out of the dopamine than if you have the VAL. And if you have the same thing here, if you have the MET dopamine receptor, you get less reward than if you have the MET uh, 158, you're gonna get really a high reward. But if you have this, just the plain MET receptor here, you're gonna get more than if you had just the plain VAL receptor. So uh, different people get different levels of reward. And so, you know, humans are really, really complicated and this is not all totally simple. And the last thing is that estrogen shifts the curve to the right wherever you are. And it does it differently if you have VAL or if you have MET. So everybody's slightly different and estrogen definitely affects 
how you get reward. And of course, we all know that a woman, during a woman's cycle, estrogen has two, two spikes. And so you, you can expect, you know, the, the, to have a different reaction from your reward center based on where you are with your estrogen. Okay, so that is a great place to stop. And I am going to be here for questions. If anybody needs to go to the restroom, go answer a call. Uh, we will start again at two o'clock. Okay, is that okay? Okay, so I'm here if anybody wants to chat. Otherwise, we'll start with food after lunch, right after you have a break. Uh, unless everybody wants to get started. Yeah, okay. go, go, go. Smoking is one that it's, it's an addiction, but it, remember I said, what I said was habit versus addiction. An addiction is a destructive habit that you are unable to turn into a constructive habit using the steps I described and I described before. So in other words, for, to start off trying to get rid of a smoking habit, let's call it a habit now, uh, I would try all those things we talked about, the rubber band, the yo-yo, uh, if you want to use those patches for a while to decrease your craving, uh, uh, that's fine. I personally, you know, am not, if you look at the literature, the, the, the success rate with them is not all that much greater at one year than without them. Okay. I, as I remember, there was one study that the, the most likely thing that, uh, that predicted whether a person was going to uh, not, still not be smoking after one year of starting their attempt was a doctor having told them that they really need to stop. Okay. Uh, and neither, uh, it was much higher than either the, the patches or, you know, whatever else it was that they tried to do a hypnosis or, and there's some other things that they've tried. So uh, I think that those, all those, those nicotine replacements, if people think they're going to help them, I don't think they harm but I, I think that, that what's more important is to use my steps and to pick out, uh, identify the triggers of when, you're, when you want to stop smoking. So you got to, and if, if they use the patches, but they don't identify the triggers and have a plan ready, say, I know I'm going to want that cigarette in the morning. So what am I going to do differently? Okay. I'm going to uh, pop my wristband. I'm going to uh, do a Sudoku puzzle. Uh, I, you know, it, I, I'm going to pull out my phone and play Angry Birds video game because I really enjoy Angry Birds video games. Okay, I'm going to give myself five minutes of, of Angry Birds video. Uh, there are all kinds of habits that you could throw in there that are much more constructive than putting that cigarette in your mouth and sucking burning plant smoke into your lungs. Okay, so now then, you also uh, mentioned alcohol and uh, oh, well, opioids and meth. Let's talk about opioids and methadone. Okay. Why would somebody who's addicted to opioids want to stop opioids? Okay. Well, I think that probably for me, the thing that I think that opioids do the, do the most damage with is their interference with uh, forming social bonds with other human beings. And that often the social bonds that are made in the setting of an opioid addiction are with highly dysfunctioning and enabling people. So, or are, are low functioning people. So, um, and then they can lead to, to physical problems like, you know, constipation or whatever. You know, I, I would think, but if somebody has used opioids for years and years, remember how I talked about how those cells in the nucleus accumbens can die off? Well, they may not be able to, to make enough endogenous in opioids, enough endorphins to make them human being. They, 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 they would be so lethargic, they would have no interest in doing anything because they couldn't reward themselves. They made a, a medication that blocked, the, uh, blocked all the transmissions out of the nucleus accumbens and uh, it helped people lose weight, dramatic weight loss, but they found a very high rate of suicide in, in it and they had to stop the drug. 
uh, Dr. Lustig talks about it in his book. So my thought on, on uh, methadone is that if somebody has a long-term habit and they can't break it by using these techniques, by substituting another habit, by forming human bonds, okay, then uh, methadone is the lesser evil of having them share needles with dysfunctional people. It allows them to make, uh, to get a job. That's an awesome social connection. Uh, it, it allows them not to have to deal with uh, people on the wrong side of the law, okay, which is in our society a very positive thing. And uh, uh, so it's, you know, it's first, first do no harm. And I think methadone does very little harm. Obviously, the ideal would be for them to stop it. What was the other one you mentioned? I'm sorry. It was alcohol and uh, yeah, naltrexone, which yeah. is kind of different. Alcohol and not naltrexone. Yeah, uh, I think that, uh, again, uh, the, uh, with alcohol, I remember how I said that now, trexone seems to work by increasing the endogenous production of endorphins. Okay. And it does that in a reverse uh, manner. Uh, you, the best way to use naltrexone is to give it at night. So at night, it turns out there's a large production of endorphins while you sleep. Okay. And what happens is uh, the, the cells that produce endorphins, okay, so if you take the naltrexone at night, your body doesn't experience uh, those endorphins. And it says, boy, I need to upregulate my endorphin production. So after, the, uh, after a while, the, uh, you're taking the naltrexone at night, so it, it keeps the endorphins upregulated. So during the day, you get an, uh, an upregulated amount of, of reward, and that that tends to help all those connections that have died. So you have a, a higher baseline level of re reward, pushing that dopamine reward curve to the right. And so that's why that's how I think the naltrexone works. And it's, it's great to help people come off of alcohol. But again, the secret is to find support, you know, among your uh, among your, your friends and people who will be supportive of you to make social connections. And that's what uh, Alcoholics Anonymous does, in my opinion. It's just making social connections because you get a sponsor, you know, which is a social connection. You get, you, there's people that you know that regularly come to your AA meetings and you get to bond with them. So that, that other people in the end are really the answer. Beating a habit is something that's, beating an addiction or a habit is something that's really hard to do on your own. Not impossible, but very hard. So. Okay, foods. So, you know, with me, it's all about cognitive dissonance. So uh, and I, I, I love to uh, challenge uh, many of your accepted beliefs. Uh, and but, but believe me, I do it to myself as well. Okay. So uh, I'm going to give you some very basic uh, food recommendations that I feel really strongly about. And I think uh, I would love to see any evidence you have that my feelings about these foods are wrong. Uh, I, would, I would bring me any, any uh, studies you have, but please don't bring me uh, these, um, uh, what do they call it, uh, uh, observational studies uh, uh, based on uh, on remembered food, food questionnaires, uh, they are totally worthless. 70% of the trials that have been done based on their results have found the opposite result. And uh, it's just, uh, that's no way to do nutrition studies. Nutrition studies should be randomized controlled trials. And uh, uh, so all this stuff that, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, eating, uh, Plant protein lowers your risk of, uh, of heart attack by 50%. That's uh, totally worthless. Okay. So anyway, um, here's what I recommend about foods. 
number one, don't eat foods that we know are poisonous. And we, we know that sugar is poisonous. Now, obviously, you could eat some sugar. I, you know, uh, I probably get some, some uh, sucrose in my, my body every now and then, you know, they, they throw in. I know I eat sausage and I know they put sucrose in sausage, okay? So there's an old saying that the dose makes the poison. So uh, you've got to get a, a poisonous dose before uh, it poisons you. So what's the poisonous dose for sugar? Well, uh, the there's a great book called The Case Against Sugar written by a, a uh, 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 he has a master's degree from MIT in physics and he's a, um, a, a scientific reporter. He's won several awards and he re did tremendous research into the uh, into sugar and uh, and cited all the studies that have been done on it, and there have been a lot of studies done on it, and, and the history of the research into sugar. And uh, the, th the thing that struck me was that in any country around the world, you don't start to see a rise in the incidence of diabetes and heart disease and obesity until the people in that country start eating more than 10 pounds of sugar per person per year. That seems to be the toxic dose for sugar. And the average consumption in the United States now is around 150 pounds per person per year. So uh, we're 15 times over the toxic dose in the United States. And uh, basically less than 10 pounds of sugar a day is, is the equivalent of like one cup of tea with a with a teaspoonful of sugar in it daily one one and a half okay so uh, if you're eating more sugar than that then uh, you're probably getting too much sugar and uh, uh, so I would recommend avoiding sugar as much as you can and certainly trying to keep under that uh, 10 pound per day limit a uh, 10 pound per year limit so uh, again, the, 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 the incidence rises slowly as you go up. So probably 10 pounds a day is not terrible. And again, how, mu how much damage you're going to develop from sugar is, is related in great part to your genetics. So uh, some people are more genetically susceptible to the uh, effects of sugar than others. And there are lots of different effects from sugar and some are, get some of them, some get the others. So, and that's true for, for most things. The second one I would recommend personally avoiding is, is alcohol. Now you'll find lots of these um, observational studies that show that drinking a, just a little bit of alcohol uh, is, uh, uh, will increase your life over not drinking any at all. So it's a J-shaped curve. And there are J-shaped curves for, for several things with, with alcohol, including uh, fatty liver disease. So just, but the, the, um, the one, the J is for, for fatty liver disease, I was just looking at the other day, is for people who drink uh, uh, 20 grams of alcohol a day or less. So I don't know very many people who can stop it at, uh, at uh, 20 grams, uh, in, that's like, you know, one drink or even part of a drink. So anyway, um, I'm not a big fan of alcohol. If, if you had, if, and, but not everybody that drinks alcohol gets addicted to it, that's absolutely for sure. Uh, and that probably has to do with that dose response curve in the, um, uh, dose response curve in the, uh, mesolimbic pathway that we saw. Uh, some people get a, a, a much bigger hit out of it than others and uh, process it in different ways. Uh, I am, I, I think that there is tremendous evidence. I, I have a, a lovely one hour lecture by a researcher who gives all the studies and can show you and I will happily share it with you on why these seed oils that we've been eating are so bad for you. Uh, it started out the very first time that humans ate seed oils in any high concentrations. And, and when I talk about seed oils, what I mean is the first one was cottonseed oil. Uh, 
soybean oil, uh, which now 70% uh, of the fat in the American diet is, uh, is a, a soybean oil. It's in everything. I'm talking about the canola oil. I'm talking about safflower oil, corn oil, and those oils. I'm not talking about olive oil. I'm not talking about palm oil. I'm not talking about coconut oil. I'm not talking about avocado oil. Okay, and that's the avocado oil that comes from the fruit of the avocado, not from the seed itself. They don't make the, the avocado oil out of the seed of the, 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 uh, of the avocado. So anyway, uh, so these seed oils are extremely high in omega-6 fatty acids. Now, you have to have some omega-6 fatty acids in your diet. And they're, they're an essential fatty acid. And uh, they uh, are processed through the cyclooxygenase pathways, and a lot of them go to make cytokines and other inflammatory mediators like the prostaglandins and the uh, interleukins and those sorts of things. So you, you have to have omega-6 primarily for your immune system, but we've never eaten omega-6 in this concentration before. For instance, soybean oil is 60% uh, uh, omega-6 fatty acids, whereas uh, meat is like, uh, uh, saturated fat from meat is like 2%. Uh, omega-6 fatty acids. Actually, palm oil and, uh, and coconut oil don't have any omega-6 in them at all. So uh, there's, there's a lot of good oils, and we never ate these seed oils. We never made anything, any kind of oil that had that level of omega-6 fatty acids in it before 1850s. 1850s, uh, they, they started selling seed oils as an oil substitute, but nobody much bought it, okay? And then uh, in um, 1911, Procter and Gamble bought a patent that a, a guy had, uh, had figured out how to hydrogenate cottonseed oil. And he basically heated it and bubbled hydrogen uh, liquid, uh, gaseous hydrogen through it, and it became solid. And so they said, hey, uh, this kind of uh, looks like butter a little bit, except it's white. And so they, uh, they said, well, this could be a substitute for lard, kind of looks like lard, okay? So uh, they started selling it as a lard substitute, uh, and it was called Crisco. And Crisco stands for uh, crystallized cottonseed oil. But the people at Procter & Gamble got with a marketing company who said, and said, how can we sell this stuff? And so in 1911, they published a Crisco cookbook and they, they, they're, they're, every recipe in the Crisco cookbook uh, used Crisco instead of lard or butter. And there were pies and cakes and they said it was scientific and it was uh, sterile, they made it in, in, in factories so it had no germs in it, and it was pure, and it was healthy for them. Around the turn of the century, around the late 1880s or so, that they got a glut of cottonseed oil because they had all these uh, cotton seeds that they, that they ginned out of the cotton to make clothing, and they didn't know what to do with them. They hated to throw them out, so they made oil out of it, and it was in, in, the, early, in the early 1800s, uh, it was used for uh, lamp, lamp oil, so they burned it in their lamps. But then when the uh, electric light bulb came in at the end of the 18th century, and they, uh, they, and they also uh, had kerosene that would, they were beginning to develop. So kerosene seemed to work better with less smoke in their lanterns than, than, the, than the cottonseed oil. So cotton, they had this tons and tons of cottonseed oil they didn't know what to do with. And, and that's why we got Crisco, uh, and they tried to, tried to feed it to their, uh, to their uh, pigs and other livestock, but the pigs lost weight and uh, got sick. And so instead, they decided to, to sell it to humans, and, and then they figured out how to put yellow dye in it and make it look like butter, and they started selling it as margarine, and the, the rest is kind of history. And then um, it turns out that 
the American Heart Association was actually a very small um, group of about 12 doctors who were interested in heart disease that met in New York City. And, uh, and uh, they, that's all they were up until like the 1940s. Uh, and uh, the, uh, they developed a theory that it was saturated fats that were raising cholesterol and cholesterol was causing heart disease. And that uh, they also found out that these uh, seed oils uh, didn't raise uh, cholesterol uh, like uh, saturated fat does. And that, that maybe that was what was causing heart disease. Well, the, by serendipity, one of the uh, uh, people who did the advertising for, uh, uh, for Procter & Gamble for their uh, seed oil project products came on this. And he said, well, we should hook up with them and support them. And that back in 1947 or so, they had a radio, uh, uh, a, a radio contest uh, where people would pay money uh, and it was like a lottery and they could win things and all the money was going to go to charity and the charity they chose was the American Heart Association and they got $450,000 out of this big nationwide radio uh, uh, charity lottery thing that they that they ran and that's and and since then it the results are history and the American Heart Association was born they put out a article and one of the first things they did was start touting how everybody should stop eating butter and stop eating uh, and especially stop uh, using uh, palm oils and the palm oils were a big competitor for the people who were doing the seed oils because they were already beginning to do the soybean oil then and uh, and they were having a lot of competition from uh, palm oil and uh, and from uh, coconut oil and so that's how we got all these things. And of course, they were, they were full of, the, the hydrogenated stuff was full of trans fats and it was really horrible for your heart. And, uh, and so, uh, and there's, uh, I, I can show you some studies about uh, how if you give rats, uh, uh, if you give rats uh, seed oils, uh, specifically corn oil, and you expose them to ultraviolet light and you shave their skin, that they will develop five times as many skin cancers as, uh, uh, as rats that are fed normal chow without the seed oils in them. So uh, I, I, can, I could go on, I could give the whole lecture on just this point, but I don't think seed oils are a good thing. If you think seed oils are a good thing, bring me your, bring me your evidence. I'd be happy to give you, give you mine and refer you to several places that will tell you about the things I've taught. Okay, eat an animal-based diet. Now, why do I say eat an animal-based diet? Well, I'm, you know, frankly, the only way we could ever know whether a vegetarian diet or a meat-based diet like mine is better would be if we got like a thousand infants and from infancy, we fed them either nothing but, but a meat-based diet or nothing but a vegetarian diet for 70 years and saw how they did, okay? And they were actually compliant with this. Well, I think you can all see that this experiment could never be done. Okay. So um, what is the next best thing? Well, uh, what's, what's called natural controlled experiments and there are lots of natural controlled experiments on vegetarian diets versus meat diets. And uh, one of the uh, interesting ones, and I'll be glad to give you the article, was a study that was done from two um, Indian tribes. And they, they have DNA from these two Indian tribes. One was in, they were both in Kentucky, and one was in Eastern Kentucky, one was in Western Kentucky. But we know from their, uh, uh, from their DNA that they were closely genetically re related. And uh, the, uh, uh, the one, one tribe, the Eastern tribe, I'm sorry, the Western tribe was a, a hunter-gatherer tribe that ate primarily meat. 
And the way you can tell what a uh, what somebody ate is you can actually take their uh, their bone marrow, okay, and you get the uh, the isotopes, especially the um, uh, the nitrogen isotopes. Uh, they're called stable isotopes. Now, uh, what a stable isotope is, and in this case, it was nitrogen 15. And a stable isotope is an isotope that doesn't break down. It's got nitrogen usually has 14 uh, uh, protons in it, but there you can have it uh, with uh, with 15, and it's totally stable. Uh, it doesn't doesn't radioactively decay over time. So you can you can tell and uh, uh, it turns out it's it's kind of like like mercury. Okay, uh, in nitrogen 15 is very low in plants. So animals that eat plants uh, have a, a much lower level of nitrogen 15. But just like mercury in the ocean, you have the the uh, there are uh, the there are fish that get some mercury by eating, eating plants that, that have the mercury bound to them. And then the, the fish that eat them, okay, they're already higher in mercury. So if they only eat fish that have eaten, got some mercury in them, they're gonna get more mercury. And then the fish that then eat them are gonna have more mercury until you get to the top chain predators so it's really full of mercury. So it works the same way with nitrogen 15 is that the top chain predators, okay, who eat animals that eat other animals <laughs> are going to have very high levels, and that uh, humans, uh, uh, the 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 pre uh, the the Paleolithic humans. Now, Paleolithic versus Neolithic. Paleolithic means before the development of agriculture, and so Paleolithic humans are all when they check their bone marrow top chain carnivores. Okay, they don't they're not vegetarians, okay, whatsoever. And it's only after humans developed uh, uh, agriculture, and that didn't happen. There's, I have not seen any proven agriculture before 16,000 years ago. I haven't seen any, any evidence of proven agriculture before then, and they don't think that it happened. So when we take these Indians and, and uh, um, the, the tribe we know from the, from the uh, stable isotopes that the uh, Western tribe were hunter-gatherers that ate primarily meat, and the, their relatives uh, who lived 400 years later uh, ate mostly um, corn, um, um, uh, squashes, and, uh, and a little bit of meat. Okay? Uh, they, uh, we and they were able to compare the skeletons, and the hunter-gatherers were five to six inches taller. Uh, the Neolithic or the uh, veg vegetable rich diet uh, of the uh, Western, of the Eastern tribe, uh, they showed uh, vitamin deficiencies, rickets. Uh, you can, in, in skeletons, you can see a pitting. That's a sign of iron deficiency anemia. Uh, you can see bars in the bones that are characteristic of tuberculosis. So we know they had, uh, Magically increased tuberculosis, and of course, the biggest and most obvious thing was their uh, their poor dentation. Uh, there was uh, less than one cavity per person on average in the the hunter gatherers, whereas the agricultural had something like uh, eighteen cavities average per person. Okay, when we look at their skulls, so uh, eating a plant based diet is really bad for your teeth. Okay, and uh, we, we have other natural experiments, uh, like the, um, they, the, uh, the Eskimos of, of Alaska ate almost nothing but meat, and they were studied intently by several different uh, um, uh, researchers and doctors and, who documented that they didn't have heart disease, they didn't have cancer, uh, and that they were tall and not obese and didn't have diabetes. And then as soon as they, they started eating more than 10 pounds of sugar and they got the refined flours and other things from the Western diet, they became fat, diabetic, and shorter. Uh, we can look at the, uh, 
Zulu. There's lots of articles about the about the Maasai warriors in Uganda and Kenya, and uh, they uh, eat a diet of uh, basically uh, milk and beef, uh, mostly uh, milk, and they also drink the blood of their cows. They're nomadic cow herders, and they, they all their food comes from their cows. But not only that, but the men of the tribe, the warriors, take a vow uh, that they will not eat any uh, plant foods because they think it saps their strength. It's a religious belief. So, uh, and uh, they have almost no heart disease. Uh, there's several doctors, and you can read the studies in JAMA and other uh, magazines from the 1960s where they went out and studied them because they couldn't figure out why they were eating this high fat diet and they, they had no heart disease. And then uh, when they move to the city and they start eating a Western diet, they get fat and have the same amount of heart disease as a normal Western person would. So that's why I personally think that an animal-based diet is the way to go. I think it's the way we evolved to eat. Uh, for uh, 1.5 uh, million years before us, Homo habilis was our direct ancestor, and he was a top chain predator and ate almost nothing but meat. We know that again from the stable isotopes and uh, other things. So I, again, I could talk about this for forever, but we're already going on, so. Um, uh, I won't even mention about all the anti-nutrients in plants. I will just briefly mention they have things like to protect, every plant tries to protect themselves against predation by, uh, uh, by animals. And they have things that are specifically designed for that, like phytates, lectins, and oxalates. And these are all very bad for you. Uh, that's all I'll say. And again, I, will, I have a lecture on this that I could share with you, but I won't do it now. Uh, so, other things that I think, I think that everybody, that the, the best food that anybody can eat is fat and lots of it, especially saturated fat and monosaturated, monounsaturated fat, which is found in rich sources in uh, olive oil and butter. Uh, fat metabolism generates a much lower burden of reactive oxygen species in the mitochondria, and I can give you tons of articles on this. And uh, they have people that eat high fat diet have a much lower level of total body inflammation uh, than, than people who eat a, a carbohydrate diet. Okay. So now other things about eating, stop eating at least two hours before bedtime. Now all of our patients have, by having high postprandial glucoses, have damaged their vagal nerve. And so they're gut transit times are so slow that they really need to stop eating five hours before bedtime because they, they just can't get the, get the food processed because they're, uh, the computer system that controls it, uh, the, the, it's like dial-up, computer connection, <laughs> okay? So uh, consider regular fasting. You, know, you all know that I'm, I'm big into fasting. The reason I'm, I'm not going, again, I could speak to you for two or three hours on fasting. But basically, uh, there's nothing, very few things that increase uh, growth hormone release as, as strongly as uh, fasting does. It also increases brain-derived natur natur naturetic factor that stimulates um, memory gain and the, the production of new memories, that the growth of new neurons, and uh, basically makes you smarter. And also increases autophagy. Autophagy is the... Uh, the process where cells form vacuoles, and in those vacuoles, they take altered and unneeded proteins and break them down to their constituent amino acids so that new proteins can be built. And that doesn't happen while you're eating. Uh, it, it, it peaks at 18 hours of, uh, of fasting. Okay, so that's just a few benefits of fasting. Okay, sleep. Okay, this one I'm going to if you would like, I have for your, um, for your uh, notebook folder, which I hope you're all keeping on your computer, I'll be happy to send you uh, this stuff that you can give to patients here. Okay. Uh, these are, uh, this is from a book, Why We Sleep, uh, uh, written by a 35-year uh, 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 
King's College of London and Harvard trained sleep researcher who's the head of the UCSF, I love UCSF sleep laboratory. Uh, and um, uh, so keep a schedule, okay. Set, uh, now that's impossible for you as residents, okay. But uh, it's very hard, but I think that with the way you, you just have your night flow, you know, what is it, four times a year or something, you might be able to do this for most of the, most of the time. Set an alarm for bedtime as well as your morning wake up if you need it. I don't need a morning wake up because I, I go to bed at a certain time and I just naturally wake up, which I think is the absolute best way to wake up if you can, if you can make it happen. Uh, don't do any exercise for at least three hours before you go to bed. This is, don't, don't go for that workout in the evening because you're going to be so stimulated, so much uh, uh, cortisol and, and adrenaline that you're not going to be able to sleep if you do that. Avoid caffeine. Well, I could go on and on again about uh, caffeine because it definitely stems uh, the uh, ventral uh, parietal nucleus, the VPN, and uh, it's just, you know, it's, it just gives you a, a, uh, a, a rush to your pleasure centers. And, of course, it does inhibit the breakdown of the factors in your brain that make you sleepy. So it's going to make it very hard for you to fall asleep. And I would just point out that in most people, uh, caffeine has about an eight-hour half-life so that even if you drink something in the morning, you've still got 25% of that caffeine left inside you, at least when you go to bed. Alcohol, alcohol is a very bad thing to drink uh, in the evenings because it leads to poor breathing when you sleep, okay? It interferes with your breathing cycle. It, uh, it will not let your, it's the most powerful uh, suppressor of rapid eye movement sleep known to man. And it causes, it's known to cause early awakenings. I can testify to that personally because I used to drink alcohol when I was you guys' age. And, uh, uh, you know, I can remember the early awakenings and I couldn't get back to sleep. Avoid eating for at least two hours before sleep and you may need to go five. Avoid stimulating medicines like decongestants, SSRIs, dopamine agonists, uh, steroids, and theophylline at night, that's common sense. Don't take a nap after 3 p.m. So if you take a nap after 3 p.m., it may make it very hard for you to fall asleep at night. If you're gonna take your nap, take it in the morning. Leave some time for relaxing and unwinding before bed. I'd recommend at least 30 minutes. So you, here again is another habit. What, what do you like to do? Do you like to knit? Do you like to play a musical instrument? Uh, do you like to paint? Do you, what relaxes you? Do you like to take a, a warm bath with some scent in the water? Okay, make that a habit for, you know, 15 to 30 minutes before you go to bed that you like to uh, uh, do some sort of religious prayers. Uh, say the rosary, say a mantra, uh, say the 99 names of Allah. You know, it's, uh, there are all kinds of things that you could do and make that a habit right before you go to bed. Uh, your bedroom is very important. It should be dark. It should be cool. Okay. No TV, no cell phones, uh, and uh, no visible clocks or computers in your bedroom. You should keep all that stuff out. Now, I know you've got to have your cell phone there, but uh, um, all that other stuff you could, you could do without in your bedroom. Okay. Try to get out into the bright sunlight for at least 30 minutes every day because you've got to get rid of the, uh, if you find yourself unable to fall asleep, get up and do some relaxing activity until you feel sleepy. Don't do anything that stimulates you, like play a, a, a combat computer game or something. You know, Obviously, you know, you'd want to uh, listen to soothing music or read a non-stimulating book poetry or something. So the anxiety of not being able to fall asleep if you lay in bed will make it impossible to fall asleep. Why can't I fall asleep? So staying up late to study makes it very much, very difficult for knowledge to go from short to long-term memory. This happens while you're asleep in your deepest sleep that 
the things you learn during the day go from the short-term memory into your long-term storage. So a lot of them may not make it if you don't get enough sleep. So staying up late to study, it's counterproductive. The bright lights, especially the blue light that you skid from sunlight, uh, totally blocks your ability to make melatonin, which you have to have to sleep. And so a lot of people, myself included, uh, set their computer, have a computer program that prevents your computer from showing blue light, okay, after sundown. It's, you set it to, to start that at sundown. And also, um, you, some people wear blue blocker glasses, and you can buy lots of blue blocker glasses on Amazon that will block that blue light that's preventing the melatonin production and put, just put them on at sundown. And, uh, um, and of course, the, the last thing is there's some evidence that uh, resonant breathing will help people fall asleep. And you all know about the resonant breathing. And um, um, it certainly is not going to overcome. If you're doing all the other points I talked about wrong, resonant breathing is not going to fix it. Okay. But it can help as part of fixing everything. Exercise is not going to take long. Okay. Uh, if you want to succeed, it has to become a regular habit with the highest priority. You know, you got to just do it and you got to do it regularly. If you don't do it regularly, it's not going to happen and you're not going to get good benefit. Cardiovascular exercises include things like walking, running, riding bicycles, and rowing. They make your heart muscles stronger with better stamina. Okay. High intensity interval training is a cardiovascular exercise, which is basically uh, doing the exercise at your maximum rate, getting your heart just level just as high as you possibly can uh, for a, a brief period of time, usually one to one and a half minutes, alternating with one to one and a half minutes of rest. And you do this for just 15 or 20 minutes, you can get uh, the same benefit uh, to your heart, uh, uh, increasing what we call the um, uh, VO2 max, or the amount of oxygen that you can burn uh, per minute. Uh, and that's a marker of, of cardiovascular stamina. Uh, you can, you can uh, from a quarter of the time, uh, in a quarter of the time it would take if you just jogged or ride, would, uh, rode a bicycle or did, worked on a, on a, on a rowing machine. So I've been doing this for a long time. You know, we're, we're, I'm a busy guy. I got lots of things I want to do. And the last thing I do is have time, four times the amount of time to get the same benefit, not doing high intensity interval training. And I'll be happy to give you all lots more information on this. Uh, it's very important to do both cardiovascular training and resistance training. Both improve cardiovascular fitness, insulin resistance, and metabolic rate but in different ways. And so you can get an additive benefit from doing both of them. So you only have to do resistance training one time per week and you can get significant benefit. Less than one hour is all that's needed. It has been associated with a reduced risk of cardiovascular disease independent of cardiovascular training. The secret is the regularity. If you do it every Saturday, okay, and I, I just do it for 45 minutes once a week, and that, that's, that gives me the benefit that, that, that I think is really good. It certainly helps my, my tone, and you won't lose your muscle mass that way, uh, and it's really good for you. Exercises associated with improved memory and intention uh, and attention. Exercises associated with improved mood. There's all kinds of reasons to exercise. I don't think I have to, I, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here. Okay, okay. again, with mental hygiene, uh, I think I've kind of covered this already with my habit stuff and my uh, reward stuff. Uh, basically, uh, uh, I think that one of the important things is learning resonant breathing. Okay, it's uh, there's a lots of ways you can do resonant breathing, or you can actually sing. If you think about it, resonant breathing is simply breathing in quickly and breathing out slowly. So what do you do when you sing? You take a deep breath, and then you sing, and you, you're not breathing in, you're singing out. So you can sing. You could, what do you, what do, you do when you say a, a rosary or a mantra? You breathe in, and you say your rosary or mantra, and then you breathe in again slowly. So it's, it's all the same thing. 
uh, it's just that uh, resonant breathing is a scientific way of maximizing the benefit, in my, my opinion, because I'm kind of a scientific kind of guy. Okay. There is nothing better for, for mental health than regular play. You need to find some way to play. I mean, I don't care if it's bridge. I don't care if it's uh, uh, miniature golf, bowling, uh, uh, whatever. It, uh, you know, I don't care if it's video games. I think that video games are good as long as you don't do them right before bed. Okay. Uh, 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 do find some way to play. You, you, play is so good for you. Seek out laughter and humor. Seek, uh, seeking out laughter and humor is one of the greatest tonics for the human soul. Go to a, a, a comedy club, watch a funny show on television, do it on a regular basis, find jokes off the internet and go bother all your um, colleagues with them, <laughs> like I do. Uh, seek out joy in singing and dancing. Okay. Uh, there's nothing better, better than, than music. I, I play the piano every day when I go home for lunch. And, uh, and dancing is just awesome. You know, I wish I were more of a dancer. I've never been much of a dancer, but I, I think it's awesome for you. Spend time in nature. There's all kinds of studies showing the benefits of lowered blood pressure, lowered cortisol level, uh, all kinds of stuff. And so just, uh, it looks, it seems like that looking at the fractal images in nature is very soothing for the brain and, and healing. Everybody, this is something I learned from an old uh, family medicine doctor when I was doing my family medicine rotation in medical school. He told me this, said everybody needs daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly vacations okay, to be healthy. You've got to get some time off. Everybody needs some time just to do what they want to do, to, to, do, to, to sing, dance, spend time in nature, whatever they want to do, and do it full time for, for a bit. And so it, increasing length. So every day, you know, I try to at least play the piano for 30 minutes, okay? Uh, I, uh, 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 every week you get, a, you get a weekend. So you want to spend half a day doing some kind of a project, a creative project, create, doing, making something creative, uh, painting a picture, building something, uh, uh, sewing a dress, whatever it is. Uh, it's, you need that weekly. And then uh, monthly, maybe we need a three-day weekend. You know, you, you need a little extra time. Every month you're going to take one whole day when you just do nothing but something you want to do. It's fun. And yearly, you need a vacation. We all get that vacation. You have vacation. So, uh, and finally, I've left the most important point to the very end. We all need to feel connected to other humans. Without these connections, we will become ill both mentally and physically. Seek out time with others. The more connections you can make, the healthier you will be. Dr. Mabry, <clears throat> I have a question for you. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, so you, you think, uh, you, you talked about abstinence for uh, a lot of those different conditions. How do you feel about uh, nicotine replacement therapy for smoking or the methadone versus uh, suboxone for opiate addiction or the naltrexone for alcoholism? 